And um, John Robinson is a tribal court judge for the Northern Cheyenne Nation. And he has some incredible stories from his youth and some great insights to share with us today. So I'm going to start by welcoming you, John. Thank you for your time this, today. Thank you for inviting me. And um, I'm going to invite you to share with us some stories, um, starting with some of your experiences in the reclamation of Alcatraz, which I think was 1969? Right, Ni November 1969. Okay. Um, maybe I better start just before 1969. Uh, in 1968, I was on relocation to Madera, California, and relocation is where they send an Indian down from the reservation to receive training. And the training is never applicable back on the reservation, so the whole idea is to get you a job off the reservation and get you set up where you won't want to go back. Um, I, after the uh, training at Madeira. I made a lot of friends down there from uh, 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 tribes in California, and I made some really good friends from uh, the Tule River Reservation in down by Porterville, California. I believe it was on November 19th. We were out cutting wood, and a friend came up and said, the Indians have taken over Alcatraz, uh -huh. and and my first response, of course, was, "What for? What do, what it, what's going on?" And they said, "I don't know. It's a it's like a demonstration." And so we loaded up a pickup and went up there uh, to Alcatraz. We went to what was called Pier 19. That's where it seemed to be the. Uh, embarkation point for people who wanted to get over to the island. And it was all young people. There was, uh, there was uh, not your older political crew or uh, these were students, uh, students from uh, the University of uh, California, Los Angeles and at Berkeley and at San Francisco State. And my friend said, well, we're going back, let's go. And I said, no, I want to stay here. You know, this, this it looks pretty interesting. Um, we found out that the only way to get to the island was you had to run a, a barricade that was set up by the Coast Guard around the island. And there were a few fishermen that were pretty excited about it and had these boats and were, were helping the Indians get out there. I believe there was only like 70, maybe 79 Indians on the first uh, batch that went out there. By the time I got there, there was probably 200. I got there on the second day. And uh, uh, we pulled in, it was night, pulled in and and uh, somebody hollered, give me your hand. I put my hand out, somebody grabbed it and I was on the island and uh, uh, spent a lot of time meeting folks and going around. It wasn't still quite sure why we were there, but that didn't matter at that time, you know. Mm -hmm. But then going around, visiting, talking with some of the students and, and the excitement uh, that was generated and the, the knowledge of these people, the, the, these young people who knew their histories, who knew uh, all about the treaties, who knew uh, all about the uh, government policies. Uh, hearing it in, in, in a single space there um, was really overwhelming, you know. And I really looked up to these guys. A lot of them was younger than I was, and some were barely older. Uh, it was a young crew. and. That next, uh, so I, I walked around. There was the, the prison itself. There was some buildings. It must have been like guard quarters. Then up on the hill, there was the warden's house. And there was another uh, uh, 
house up there too. So that night I spent out there on the wharf helping other people onto the island. And the next morning I, I walked up to the highest peak right up by the, the warden's house there. And I looked out and I looked out over the San Francisco Bay. I looked at San Francisco itself and I looked at what we were standing on and I guess my thought was, I thought when I was in the mountains that that was pure freedom. Mm -hmm. I was free to do as I want, chasing those, those, those uh, wild horses and living a free life. But there was still a weight on there. It was still uh, under the government. It was still on a reservation. And at that point, what I knew standing there was this is Indian land. And I felt a sense of freedom at that moment that I have never, had never experienced before. It was uh, as though we were a part of that moving water. We could move in that water, we could move on that land, we could move in the air. We were all a part of it. And that's real freedom. There was no air pushing us down. There was no ground holding us up. There was no streams pushing us one way or another way. We were just all a part of it, you know. And that's real freedom when you, when you, when, once you get a sense of that. And that was something that it, it wasn't just an, an experience, but it's something that I've carried with me ever since. Because once you've experienced true freedom, you can never go back. You, you cannot go back to, it is, it's like that last little weight of, of, of whatever's keeping you down, if it's fear, if it's mistrust, if it's whatever that's stripped it, you know. It was, um, it was a sense shared by everybody there. And what was, what was different about Alcatraz? Well, there were a lot of things different. First of all, the, the people that took it over were all students. Mm -hmm. And they had planned that for weeks and months. And they had even taken a, a couple trips out there just to experience what it's gonna be like, you mm -hmm. know? And so they were ready for it in more ways than one because by day three, it wasn't just a bunch of, of young people standing out there with signs, we want this, we want that, you know. We had, we had a community there. Uh, and this was, uh, uh, I always give credit, the, the men were looked upon as some of the great planners and all that. But the women is the one that really held us together because they came up by day two. They had already started the uh, setting up the kitchens. Um, by day three, we had a, a first aid station. We had schools for the, for the little ones. Everything that you would expect in a community was right there. Mm -hmm. We were totally dependent on what we could get from the outside, from off the island. But that's not unlike a lot of reservations, you know. Uh, everything has to be shipped in, and if you don't have a way to get off the reservation to get these stuff, you gotta wait till it's shipped in. The mail comes in, the food comes in. Uh, some reservations, the water's so bad, the water's shipped in, you know. Uh, we didn't have water. There was a big water uh, a barge there, and that's where they got their water from. Uh, there was no place to grow a garden. There was just, it's a rock. Mm. Um, so ev we, it was totally dependent. There weren't even uh, communications to the mainland. <coughs> Excuse me. So what I saw was every, we, f that we found one old truck and got a few of the boys back there with their whatever tools we could find. 
and within a short time they had that old truck running so they'd load up the kids and drive them around the, drive them around the rock you know uh, and there was meetings every day and the meetings were not the men sitting over there looking stern while the women folk were in there cooking you know I mean it was everybody who had a voice everybody was uh, invited in and sat there and d daily decisions were made and daily briefings were made on on the progress when they took the island they based it on a um, one of the Fort Laramie treaties and the Fort Laramie Treaty said that under uh, under the terms of that treaty, the Sioux, the Cheyenne, the Arapaho, and I believe there was two other uh, that may have signed that one. But any any land, any lands of the U.S. government that were not in use could be claimed by those who signed the treaty. So there were some uh, Sioux people involved, so they uh, took it from that approach. On behalf of the great Sioux Nation, we're, we're claiming this under the terms of the treaty, and then we're sharing it with all tribes. And that's where we came up with our, our name, Indians of All Tribes. Mm -hmm. And um, the composition of the people kind of changed, but um, the the dedication never left mm -hmm. um, the um, we wanted uh, uh, we wanted to build a college there and in fact that actually happened we got a college but it wasn't right there uh, the college was um, built over by uh, univer uh, by Davis California by the University of California and it was called to Ganawida Quetzalcoatl, and which is one is a Mexican um, deity, and the other is, uh, I believe, from the Iroquois. Mm -hmm. um, and so that was the name of the university. I don't know the status of it now, but th that actually got uh, uh, recognition. Um, and the most impressive thing about this was it was totally nonviolent. We weren't told by the, the cops or anybody, don't take no weapons out there. This, this is not, uh, or, you know, this was when we got there, so we, first thing uh, security did was warn us, if you got any weapons, throw them in the bay. They're not, they're not allowed here. Um, Everything was through uh, prayer and through negotiation and action, you know. Uh, it wasn't, we didn't sit around just pray all day for relief or um, we didn't spend all the time negotiating with somebody, looking for somebody to negotiate with. The community life was going and I mean, we had community get togethers. Uh, 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 all the, the children belonged to everybody. Everybody was a caretaker of all the children. And such a wonderful bunch of kids. Uh, there's an actor, um, Benjamin Bratt. Oh. He was out there as a child. His mom brought him out. Um, there's been a lot of uh, successful people from that endeavor. I was roommates with John Trudell John and I and Johnny Berka set up that first, um, it was called uh, Al Alcatraz Free Radio. And we worked with, the, there was an uh, independent uh, radio station in San Francisco called KSAN. So we, we set up the radio for that. And we were able to get broadcasts out and receive broadcasts in, you know. And that was pretty cool. And then the, the leadership, the leadership kind of just emerged and the leadership was really incredible. Uh, Richard Oakes deserves all the credit uh, as being the, the, the main leader. Richard was this wonderful man from New York, Iroquois, he brought his family. He married this lady from, I think she's a Pomo from 
Stuart's point, I believe, which is in California. And uh, uh, Richard took the lead. He was a, a former iron worker. And he was in the, from the, the streets, pretty much New York, very uh, uh, intelligent, very good speaker, soft-spoken. But he was kind of built like a steel worker, kind of like a little rock. And um, so he, he took the role as negotiating. And one thing that he um, insisted on, that this was peaceful, and that once those people were, were selected as a people to negotiate, nobody else would be holding their little uh, uh, side interviews or trying to meet with these other folks you know mm. keep it focused keep it focused because this is where the people's message were going to and then this small group of people were in contact with people from all over the world we had support from like uh, Japan Australia uh, indigenous people from all over the world from uh, Finland from uh, uh, it's, it's some country that's a part of Russia, some of it all the way down through the, the Americas, um, Samoa, just all over the world. Mm. Um, and a lot of them actually came there physically, others were just supporting uh, the, the whole thing. Everybody wanted it to happen because when people ask the question, why Alcatraz? I mean, there's nothing here. It's just a big rock, there's dry, there's no vegetation, there's no water, there's no electricity. They, they just hammered on all the nose, you know. <coughs> the response was, take a look at our reservations, where we come from, and you're going to find that this thing symbolizes exactly where we came from. There's not much difference. We haul our water. Uh, things are shipped in. We can't grow because of the ground is so bad. Uh, there's the education. There, there's no. Uh, there, there's no quality education. There's no um, quality health care. Uh, and what they did is they brought worldwide attention. What we did was brought worldwide attention to the reservations themselves. And all of a sudden, reservations in South Dakota and Oklahoma and wherever in California were receiving visitors from all over the world taking a look at, at what they were. And there was legislation being generated as a result of this. As a result of that, our housing improved. Uh, we got uh, Clean Air Acts. We got um, uh, improved health care. Uh, uh, we got uh, attention to our, our justice system. Um, th the uh, Violence Against Women Act uh, actually came into fruition. Prior to that, there was, there was nothing there for, for the, the women who were victims of uh, domestic violence. Um, it was just a, a huge number of acts. Uh, uh, the, uh, Indian Child Welfare Act was one of the most important. This, this recognized that only the tribe had the sovereign authority to make a decision on bringing a child home over an Indian child of their tribe. Yeah. That had never been done. That was huge because mm -hmm. the, the implications uh, uh, go into every aspect of, of our community life, mm -hmm. you know. And uh, so to me, it was a success. Mm -hmm. And it was successful because the other reason was uh, this is what the leadership at that time stated is um, you always negotiate with the president or the president's team uh, or one of the, like the Department of Interior, but nothing less, nothing less and never the Department of Justice, because once you start negotiating with the Department of Justice, 
you're, that's an admission of a criminal act and you're negotiating for your own freedom. Mm. And that doesn't make sense, but that, that is, uh, that, that shaped my view. Mm. That shaped my view is you always identify who the person is responsible over the, um, whatever the need is, mm -hmm. and that's who you deal with, mm -hmm. you know. You don't go well, through these really, areas. It sounds like it was an exercise in sovereignty in mm -hmm. um, tribal, uh, the yeah, sovereignty it, of tribal nations. It, it took the thought process into mm -hmm. action. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm wondering if um, in the time we have remaining, if you could maybe mention um, the paths that some of you chose after you left Alcatraz, because that was a year of your life, and then you and Geneva and Johnny and others went on to carry that work through your lives, as I understand it. Yeah, ev it, everybody I know who was vol involved in the action became successful in their own right. Um, we went different directions. Uh, one friend is uh, Dennis Hastings, for instance, is a curator of a large uh, uh, museum and, and anthropological studies down at um, uh, Omaha, Nebraska for, oh, I think it's for the Ponca tribe or the Omaha tribe, I can't remember. Uh, John Trudell, of course, uh, uh, has passed, but he went on to become a spokesperson for uh, Indian issues throughout the uh, uh, country, throughout the world, mm -hmm. and is recognized as a, a poet, and, and um, uh, he was a good person. Uh, Johnny Bear Cub from uh, uh, Fort Peck. She's an Assiniboine. She went on to, uh, uh, she started back and went, was on the tribal council. She went to law school. She became a judge. And then now she's, uh, she's working uh, in the field of, uh, of uh, uh, energy, um, alternative energy, I think they call mm -hmm. it. Uh, Geneva Seaboy, who's from Sisseton, Wahpeton in South Dakota, she went on to become a, a leading figure in, in, in social work and uh, actually does, uh, teaches at various universities uh, in that field. Lenata uh, um, Means, uh, I'm sorry, Lenata. I can't think, she's got a different last name now. But um, she was a boyer, that's her maiden name. Mm -hmm. uh, she's Shoshone Bannock, she is an author, she is uh, 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 an, uh, a speaker, and a. Uh, she's very involved in the Indian issues mm -hmm. at the congressional level now. Mm -hmm and at the, in the state level, state uh, legislative uh, level. Uh, George Horse Capture took over the, he's from uh, up north, um, Fort Belknap, and he was a curator at the, uh, up for, over the Indian uh, portion of the, the museum up there, and, and I think it's in Great Falls. He was out at Smithsonian as part of the Smithsonian uh, Museum staff for years until, so that was his retirement and uh, unfortunately he has since passed. And, and yourself? Um. Myself, I uh, became active in our court system mm -hmm. and I started out uh, representing people and I moved on to uh, become a judge. Mm -hmm. And uh, at one point, briefly, I was tribal chairman, and uh, now I'm a judge again. Yeah. Just sounds so inspiring, um, and uh, we'll have hopefully some more opportunities to get some more details about um, your role and, um, and all that you and your um, friends and colleagues achieved uh, on Alcatraz. And, um, but thank you for the stories that you've been able to share so far, John. Thank you.